The NSA has been collecting phone records on all Americans. President Obama reviewed the situation and said, hmm, we got to stop doing this. But, you know, the NSA isn't the only organization that's tapped into your phone, your computer. It follows your every move. Julia Angwin knows all of this with some authority. You see, she's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and an investigative reporter who, as an experiment, she tried to erase her digital footprint. She quit using Google. She ditched her smartphone. And she wrote about what she discovered in her newest book called Dragnet Nation, a quest for privacy, security, and freedom in a world of relentless surveillance. Uh, surveillance. Julia Angwin, welcome to the Bob River Show. Hi, Julia. Hi, it's great to be here. So I had a chance to uh, crack open your book last night. And I had last minute, I flipped through it. I started, you know, I do, like I'm going to interview you. So I popped into different sections of the book and started reading. It's fascinating. It's easy to read. And I am a bona fide paranoid conspiracy theorist. <laughs> and you told me stuff that shocked me. I know. I'm sorry about that. It's true that there's just endless amounts of paranoia out there, and I continually find myself being under paranoid. Well, uh, I, I, first off, your experiment. So you you basically and tell tell people about what do you what is the thing you put your phone in if you don't want to be tracked? Oh, I put my phone in this bag, which is basically what they call a Faraday cage. It's, a Faraday cage is uh, isn't that something spies used to do to not be tracked? You know, it's something that anyone does. Yeah, but spies definitely do it. You know, it's it's a way to block electromagnetic signals. So a Faraday cage is any, you could have a room that's a Faraday cage that's lined with metal and then signals don't go through the walls. NSA, for instance, the whole building is a Faraday cage. So no one can cage. snoop on the NSA while they're <laughs> snooping on us. Yeah, exactly. It's a one-way snooping situation. Wow. <laughs> All right. So when you disconnect it, now you tried to just disconnect from Google and see how it impacted your life. What happened? Leaving Google search was um, hard because I had gotten used to them doing all the work for me. You know, as soon as I start typing, they start to fill out your sentence. You know, they mind, they read your mind, and it's so convenient, except for the fact that it's also they're reading your mind. The reason they're reading your mind is they know everything about you. <laughs> so I decided to use a privacy-protecting search engine called DuckDuckGo, and it was hard because I had gotten so lazy that I was, like, kind of annoyed at first that I had to write the whole word, you know, and they weren't finishing it for me, and then they didn't know I lived in New York, so I had to write the words New York. Um, but eventually I realized it wasn't that hard, and it was a pretty small price to pay to protect my privacy. So does Google know everything about you? Like, that that's interesting, because if I'm typing, if I'm looking for the name of a comedian or something, I'll type in the first few letters, and it'll have the comedian I care about, and I'll think, wow, that comedian must be popular, because if you just type in the first two letters of his name, he shows up. But that's not really true, is it? No, because when I type in two letters, I never get a comedian. You get a, somebody you care about. <laughs> right. They know that much about your search history. Yes, they do. And by the way, they're doing it because they want to provide you with what you want. And it probably is working in many cases. But the problem is we don't have any assurances of what they're going to do with that data. They could do anything they wanted. They know everything about you, and they want to, if they want to be evil, they could. And you say in your book that even though they all of these companies say, oh, it's just anonymous data, we don't know anyone's name, that you say just with minimal tracking, Putting two and two together, computers can identify people 95% of the time? Well, amazingly, um, location data, for instance. So if you, if you have four discrete location points in your day where you were with your smartphone, they, researchers have found that 95% of people can uniquely be identified. by and your, your name and address and everything about you. Wow. And so the companies aren't necessarily, so they're saying, well, we don't care about that information, but all they'd have to, do, it's like a game of peekaboo, all they'd have to do is pull the hands from their eyes and they could identify everyone who's using their service. Right, exactly. And they mm. say they won't, or they might not, or they maybe in the future might, or, you know, but the problem is it's all very legal language. Most of these companies have these gobbledygook privacy policies that basically guarantee them the right to do whatever they want. Mm. Now, one of the things a lot of people say, and I'm with this, too, because I love the convenience of this stuff. People say, well, if you ain't got nothing to hide, what do you care? If you're a crook, you should be caught. And, and, but there are so many examples in your book 
of how this information or how the excess access to what seems like harmful informa- harmless information ends up hurting someone. Talk about someone who got joined into a Facebook group without even their requesting to be joined into it, and it upended their life. Right. So I tell the story in this book of this woman, actually two people, at the college students at the University of Texas, Austin, who were, had joined the queer chorus on campus, which is basically, you know, as it's described, it's for students who are gay and lesbian who want to sing. And basically the person who led this chorus added them to the Facebook group Queer Chorus. But what nobody involved in this realized was that when you're added to a group on Facebook, first of all, you're added without your knowledge and consent. So it doesn't say, do you want to join the group Facebook? It says, you have been joined to the group. And then at that time, it automatically sent a notification to all their friends and family saying they've been joined to this group. Oh, great. So yeah. Some students ha- were basically outed to their parents who didn't know about their child's sexual orientation and in both cases had devastating consequences. One woman didn't speak to her father for, he didn't speak to her for six months. The other one, it was uh, his father didn't speak to him for, for weeks. But it was just a and, really... And you, by the way, you, 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 you showed the post, the father went on the group and, you know, wrote essentially really angry stuff about, you know, you queers get off, you know, and this stuff. And, the, and meanwhile, it was his daughter's group and he was like getting, he was posting all this hate stuff. Yeah, it's really it was. It's awful. really awful stuff. All right, that's one example, uh, but there are more. Uh, stores track people. Um, what are some of the other like real life pitfalls that really good people can get hooked up with? Uh, like I, I don't know. I went to get my driver's license renewed, and they said we, we won't renew it until you pay a traffic ticket from 1978. Really? Yeah, and I went. Wow, computers are getting really good. <laughs> they sure are. What are some of the other things in your book? of driver's license, I tell the story in my book of this guy, John Gass, who's a boiler repair man in Massachusetts. And one day he got a letter from the driver's license department saying, your license has been revoked. And he called. They wouldn't tell him why. They say, he said, they said, I have to show up at a hearing. And at the hearing, they said, look, your, our facial recognition technology has flagged your photo as looking too similar to the photo of this other guy. We think you guys have committed identity theft. Prove that you're really who you are. Mm. Not, and, not. We have to prove that you're not. Yeah. You have to prove who you are. Right. And so this is like flipping the presumption of innocence. Right. Now he has to. Pr- he's presumed guilty until he proves his innocence. Right? So if technology proves you guilty, statistically, you are guilty. Well, that's the problem. Is that there was never going to be a reason in the past for the DMV in Massachusetts to investigate John Gass, unless he had too many tickets, or right, if there was some reason, they wouldn't have devoted the resources. But the technology makes it so easy for basically all these agencies to, quote, investigate all of us, right? They just sweep all our information up in a dragnet, and then they look through, they're like, hmm, who looks bad in here, you know? And so we were, none of us were ever really in that police lineup before, and now we are. And in facial recognition, I mean, everybody has a doppelganger out there. People tell me all the time, you could be Brad Pitt's brother. I mean, <laughs> no, they don't. Well, well, actually, they don't. But, <laughs> but, that's a good, uh, but maybe they tell somebody I mean, that. You know, somebody a lot of people look very similar in this world. I know. I get that all the time. I look just like Angelina Jolie. So, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> me too. So, yeah, Jody too. So the other thing that you talk about is you may be screwed over in ways you will never even know. The job you don't get. The insurance you get denied. Other things like that, because these companies are now buying massive treasure troves. You say a dragnet, you know, to catch people and anything, but also massive treasure troves of information to uh, basically judge everyone. Correct. I mean, that's their explicit purpose of these big databases is to create judgments about you. And, you know, we've already seen this happening. So when we wrote in my team at the Wall Street Journal about Staples, Staples um, on its website sells its office supplies for different prices at di- in different zip codes because they basically have decided that people in those zip codes don't live near a competitor store so they can pay more. And we were So wait a minute, if I live in Redmond, right next to the Microsoft campus, should I get a fake alias in Kentucky to do all of my online shopping? Yeah, uh, yeah. actually, you can go to our website, and there's a calculator that it will tell you whether you live in one of the zip codes that's getting the higher or the lower price, and then you can wow. adjust accordingly. <laughs> uh, 
I just got my Staples Rewards yesterday, and I love that. But are you telling me that, you know, people could buy this information? Maybe there's an environmental company that sees how much printer paper I go through, and they could send me hate mail about, you know, you're <laughs> killing too many trees. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that, but that could happen. Uh, the one, yeah. uh, the Joe one joined the queer printer group the, at his, uh, <laughs> his local well, college. Well, one chapter yeah. I read in your book is kind of scary: is when people have health issues and they go on a on a website or something to research or maybe to talk to somebody else about their mental illness or a disease. Insurance companies and and drug makers and stuff are are getting information off these sites as well about you. Yeah, I tell this story in my book, a really sad story about these two people who were met and were talking on a password-protected patients forum about mental health issues that they were both struggling with. And what they received a notice from the website saying, look, our website has been broken into by, I mean, of all things, Nielsen, the company that does the media monitoring of TV ratings and all such things, they had created a fake profile and gone in to scrape the forums um, for patient information, presumably to sell it to their clients who want to know what people are talking about, what drugs they use. And then even more shocking, the website itself said, and by the way, in case you don't notice in our fine print, we also sell your information. So, you know, it's like this is the problem of privacy in today's world is it's not just the unauthorized intrusions. It's the ones that you didn't even know you authorized. Guys, no one reads those agreements. All right, I know you got to go, Julia. Fantastic. If you're ever in Seattle, stop up and say hi. We'll, we'll know that you. you're here. We'll all freak out and be paranoid together. <laughs> It'll be so much fun. All right, the book is great, by the way, folks. It's really easy to read with lots of examples if you've always wondered, like, well, what is this information doing? Julia Angwin, Dragnet Nation. Thanks, Julia.